What's up, everybody? We are taking our first look at a trial that's been going on that a bunch of you have asked me questions on, and I wasn't really sure why after watching most of the state's opening statement. But then once the defense got up, I understood the very interesting legal aspect here of this case where a teenager is accused of taking the life of her mother. They have all the evidence pointing and even admissions that she did this. But the defense is insanity, not guilty by reason of insanity. And there are all sorts of details in this case that make it incredibly interesting and different from so many of the other cases that we've watched, not just her age, but also who is on her side and supporting her. It was, it was very surprising to me. I'll just say that. So we're going to take a look at this case. We're going to go through the opening statements. We're going to recap and react to some of the witness testimony and focus in on the expert testimony about her potential insanity to see if you think this fits into the standard that's necessary, because that is what this jury is going to have to decide. Is she not guilty based on what that defense expert says? And guess what? There was a point of the trial where it seemed like the defense expert may be struck as a whole as a witness. And the judge had some very interesting reasons why he didn't end up doing that, which so many of you asked about as well. Long intro, because this is our first look at a trial that if you guys are interested in it, let me know by hitting that like button and commenting that you want me to continue following the trial. I think it's going to end relatively quickly here. So maybe just another video on it as a recap when there's a verdict or something, but I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say and what your questions are about this Carly Gregg trial. So the best way to summarize a case and to understand what's going on happens in opening statements. Um, so anybody that's new to this case, like I was, I knew nothing about it. So my first interaction with it was the state's opening statement. I thought it was a very good opening statement. Discussed how she was a troubled teen with the defendant in this case, Carly Gregg, a troubled teen with a secret life, secret burner phones, talking to friends when she shouldn't have been, breaking curfew, using weed pens, uh, cutting, um, going through all sorts of things as a teenager that was spiraling down. And one day she got in a fight with a friend who went at school, who went and talked to her mom, who was a teacher at the school and saying, Carly spiraling, basically mom goes home looking for the burner phones and other things in the room. And that is when Carly went to her mom's room, got a firearm, went and ended her mom's life. And I'm going to play just a little portion here so you can hear exactly how the state describes it to the jury, which again, this is the jury's first uh, basically first interaction with this case and understanding what's going on. And this is how the state explains it. I think it's pretty effective and we'll get into kind of my mindset at the end of the state's opening here. Ashley Smiley and Carly Gregg. So Ashley Smiley is the mom. Carly Gregg is the defendant. Immediately, Carly goes and lets the dogs out. You'll hear testimony that Ashley then goes into Carly's room. You'll hear that while Ashley is in her room, that Carly's still outside. At some point, Ashley finds uh, what law enforcement believed to be the four boxes that contain vape pens. So it was the vape pens, another paraphernalia that she was looking for that she found. By the way, there's actually a video clip from a camera inside the house that we're going to watch later of exactly what happened. You don't see what happened in the room where she fired the firearm, but you see how she looks. Does she look normal? Does she look crazed? Does she look like she's you know temporarily insane for some reason? Is she acting frantic? We're going to get to watch what she's describing here later on a video from the kitchen inside the house. Testimony will be that we believe she carried them from Carly's room to her bedroom, went back to searching Carly's room. The evidence will show that almost immediately upon Carly coming inside the house, that she walks straight to her parents, goes straight to her mom. By the way, there are like freezes and glitches throughout a couple of these videos. It's so annoying. Nothing I can do about it. We can still make out what she says. Side of the bed and removes a 357 Magnum from under the mattress. We believe the testimony will be that then she. So there's a loaded firearm under the mattress. The stepfather testifies later that the mom kept it there because, as we'll find out, some trauma in Carly's past. There was an abusive father slash ex husband of Carly and ex husband of the mom that she was afraid would show up one day. So that's why the mom had it loaded under the mattress, but Carly knew about it. She concealed that 357 Magnum behind her back as she walked through the kitchen. She peeks her head around. We believe the testimony will show that she peeks her head around the kitchen to make sure that her mom hasn't come out of her bedroom. We believe the evidence will then show that she walked with that 357 Magnum behind her back, walked in to her own bedroom, and then three, fired three shots into her mother, killing her. 
We believe the testimony will then be that that very moment after she shot and killed her mother, she then hides that gun back out of the camera, walks back into that kitchen, sits down on a stool with a gun behind her, picks up her mother's cell phone, puts her mom's passcode into the phone. We believe the testimony will be, but then she texts her stepdad and said something to the effect of, when will you be home, honey? Testimony will be that then she waited for him to respond. I'll be a little bit longer. She sends him a thumbs up. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe the testimony will then be that after she puts the phone back down and walks out of sight with the camera, that between the next 45 minutes or so, that the defendant reaches out to or attempts to reach out to about five or six of her friends. Some were FaceTime, some were text messages. We believe the evidence will show that during this time, she was asking them all for help, trying to get them to come over to her house. She wouldn't tell them why. We believe that one of them is going to say he even offered to call 911, and she told him no. The evidence will also be that one of these friends did, in fact, come over to help Carly that day. She didn't know why, but she knew that her friend needed help, and she went to that home. <clears throat> we believe the evidence will show that when that friend arrived at Carly's house, that Carly walked to the front door, asked her, are you squeamish around dead bodies? We believe the evidence will show that then she took that friend and showed her her dead mother laying on the floor. We believe the evidence will show that after that, she says, I put three in my mom and I got three more waiting for my stepdad when he gets home. We believe the evidence will show that then she tells this friend, hey, why don't you go wait outside in the backyard? My stepdad's about to be home. This friend will testify that she does go in the backyard and she hears gunshots. And the next thing she sees is Carly coming out of the back door. We believe the testimony will be that she fell out of the back, she fell down coming out of the back door, gets up and tells her to run. And these two individuals, this friend and Carly, jump over the fence and run separate directions. You'll hear testimony uh, that there was a 911 call. You'll hear a frantic Heath Smiley telling the dispatcher, oh my God, she's killed her mother. She hit me in the neck, it grazed me. She tried to kill me too. She's run off. You'll hear from law enforcement when they arrived on the scene that Carly Gregg had fled the scene. You'll hear from law enforcement that when they arrived on the scene, Ashley Smiley was very much dead in the floor in Carly's bedroom and that they found that Heath Smiley had been shot and hit in the shoulder. A three and three. So that's generally the facts of what happened. And I will tell you, after watching the evidence presented through the witnesses, that's pretty much, I mean, you know, the state's got their spin on it and they're making their arguments here, even though it's opening statements. But generally speaking, that is how the facts have laid themselves out. As the trial went on, they have surveillance, they have Carly fleeing, they have officers testifying to go picking her up. She's got gunshot residue on her hand. She admits that she used the right hand to fire the weapon. Like literally, this is a slam dunk. So I'm listening to this opening and I'm saying, well, there's got to be more, right? What's the defense here? It's got to be an affirmative defense of some sort. Is it going to be that the mom abused her? Is it going to be an insanity defense, self-defense? Like what, what's the defense? Because this seems way too easy, but that's exactly how you're supposed to feel after the state's opening statement. So they did a good job laying out the facts in a light most favorable to them, but the defense gets up and we get to their, hear their opening statement. And then we figure out what this trial is actually going to be about. Okay, it's not a whodunit, as I say, with many of these trials with affirmative defenses, because you have to admit that you committed the criminal act, but there is some reason why it is not criminal. So the defense's entire opening is only about 10 minutes. So we're gonna we're gonna listen to that and how she says, you know, there were three victims that day. It wasn't just two, the mom and the stepdad, but Carly is also a victim, and they'll discuss why. And I thought this was also a very good opening because she drops the bombshell of guess. So, so mom is passed away. Stepdad, um, was shot and, you know, called nine one one and said, she tried to shoot me too or kill me too. But she drops the bombshell here of who is supporting Carly and absolutely believes in this insanity defense. None other than the second victim in this case, who is still alive to tell the story and talk about what Carly looked like and what she seemed like that day. And that's, that's huge. And you very rarely have that as a criminal defense attorney. Action on March 19th to bring about the death of Ashley Smiley and the injuries to Heath Smiley. However, this is a why case. Why did it happen? Why did this exceptional child with no history of violence, who was loved by her friends, her teachers, her parents, who had a good home life, who loved her mother, why did she shoot her mom? Why did they paint her as almost like, an exceptional child, perfect child, love, no issues. And we're going to get to the expert testimony later about looking through her medical records and interviewing her. I definitely think Carly Gregg, if you want my opinion, 
She's somewhere in between the way the defense describes her and, and what the state describes her. She's not probably a stone cold killer who wanted to end her mom's life because her mom found her vape pens or weed pens and burner phones and whatever. And her parents were too strict, but I'm not so sure she didn't have any foreseeable issues that, you know, that all of this mental health issue went completely undiagnosed, which is kind of what they're saying. So it's probably somewhere in the middle, but whether or not in that moment, she understood the consequences of her actions. She understood right from wrong. She knew what she was doing which is the insanity defense. That's going to be the question for the jury. And the question I want to hear from you guys, what you think as we listen to the way the state and the defense set it up, we talk through some of the evidence and then we really dig in on the expert testimony to see how all of this applies. She shoot at her stepfather. The state would like you to believe the answer to those questions don't matter, but we know better than that. The answers to those questions is why we're here today. And it's what you're here to do. We believe the evidence will show that there were three victims on March 19th, Ashley Smiley, Heath Smiley, and Carly Smiley, and Carly Gregg, that they were all three victims. We believe the evidence will show that Carly had been suffering from a mental illness, that Carly was not aware on March 19th that she had a mental illness. We believe the evidence will show that Carly's parents who lived with her were not aware that illness. We believe the evidence will show that Carly's close friends who saw her at school every day were not aware that Carly was suffering from a mental illness because it's hard to look at a person and understand that they have a mental illness. It's hard to look at a person and know that they have a mental illness. That's why it's often referred to as the invisible disease. A person can exhibit symptoms of a mental illness without people necessarily knowing that they have one or other people necessarily knowing a person has. While the events on March 19th were tragic, the events on March 19th were not intentional. The evidence will show, and the testimony will show, that Carly Gregg loved her mother, that Carly Gregg and her mother had a loving, close relationship. Carly Gregg's mom loved her. In fact, her life revolved around Carly, as parents' lives often do revolve. Carly very much wanted to please her mother. Carly was an exceptional student, made a 30 on the ACT, when she was 13 years old. She was the apple of her mother and her stepfather's eye. And you will understand by the conclusion of this hearing why Carly's stepfather is standing behind her. Because So it cut out there, but what she said was why Carly's stepfather, the victim, one of the victims in this case that she fired a firearm at, is still standing behind her. You heard that right. He is going to come and testify as a positive witness. Now the state's going to call him, so he's going to be a state witness and a defense witness, but he is on Carly's side. That is so unusual. She took the life of his wife. He knows that to be true. And again, this is his stepdaughter. So he married into fatherhood. And he is standing behind his stepdaughter even after she took the life of his wife and attempted to take his life. That's what she's charged with. That's got to be like for the jury, that's got to make... It's got to make you perk up and be like, oh, wow, this is different. This isn't just some bogus insanity defense that nobody believes and that some defense lawyer came up with and they're trying to throw it against the wall to see if it sticks. That's not what this is. I mean, that's what it indicates to me that this is different. He knows on March 19th, there were three victims, Ashley, Heath, and Carl. The state will ask you to take your good judgment, to take your common sense and to put it in a bucket to put the lid on the bucket and to toss the bucket out of this courtroom. We implore you not to do that, to retain your common sense, to retain your good judgment, and to make sure that you are listening to the evidence as it's presented, because it doesn't matter how many witnesses the state puts on, their story is filled with inconsistencies because they are not telling the whole story. The evidence will not show that Carly was ever deemed dangerous by anyone. The evidence will not show that Carly ever had any desire to hurt her mother. The evidence will not show that Carly ever had any desire to hurt any person. The evidence will not show that Carly invited people over to her house to view her mom's body. What it will show is that on March 19th, a hysterical Carly called her closest friends, begging them for help, begging them to help her. The evidence will show that Carly did not recognize Heath Smiley when he got home that day. You'll hear that from him. 
Uh, she, she said, I was going to say, how do you think they're going to prove that, that she didn't recognize him that day? She can have testify. Well, he says, it. he says, I don't think she knew who I was. That Carly did not recognize Heath Smiley when he got home that day. You'll hear that from him himself. The evidence will show that Carly was so terrified when Heath Smiley got home on March 19th, that even after Carly left the house, Heath walked around the house with the handgun in his hand looking for an intruder because he was convinced by Carly, by how she appeared, by how she acted, he did that day. By the child he had not years, that he was, that she was terrified, something in that house to cause that kind of terror in Carly. What the evidence will not show is that Carly had a drug problem. What the evidence will not show is that Carly and her mother had any argument on March 19th. What the evidence will not show is that Carly had any desire to hurt her stepfather. What the evidence will not show is that Ashley Smiley was angry when she left school that day, or that Ashley Smiley was upset with Carly when she left school that day, or that after they got home on March 19th, Ashley and Carly engaged in an argument. The evidence will not show that Ashley Smiley found any. It definitely doesn't seem from the video. Again, you're going to get to see it here as well, that they were arguing or yelling at each other or fighting either. So a lot of the way the defense is presenting these facts is kind of how I think they came out of trial as well, but it's going to be up to the jury when they hear, you know, a friend say this or the, the stepfather say that whose version of the events makes more sense. Did she intend to do this to her mom? Did she go and get the fire and wonders because she was mad at her mom or did she snap? Was she insane? Did she not know what she was doing? Was it because of a mental illness? Anything in Carly's bedroom that would have caused an argument. The evidence will not show that Carly intended to hurt anyone. The evidence will not show that Carly has not grieved her mother's loss. The evidence will not show that law enforcement did their due diligence in investigating this matter. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. She's using a little too many double negatives. The evidence will not show that Carly did not grieve the mother, the loss of her mother. I would have just said the evidence will show she did grieve the loss of her mother. Unless I guess she's saying nobody's going to come testify and say that she didn't grieve the loss of her mother. It's just hard to say that in a uh, real specific way. The evidence will not show that Carly was abusing or misusing prescription medication. The evidence will not show that Carly had was just a teenager who had a life that her parents didn't know everything about. That's called having a teenager and being a parent. The evidence will not show that Carly had ever tried to harm another person, had ever had a desire to hurt another person. The evidence will not show that Carly is a monster, that Carly was a difficult child, a troubled child, or a deranged child. The evidence will not show that Carly Gregg does not deserve you to return a verdict of not guilty. Now, the evidence will show that Carly had a family history of mental illness. In fact, it was well documented. The evidence will show that Carly was concerned that something was wrong with her. She wrote journal entries about it. The evidence will show that Carly was afraid she had the same mental illness that her father had. Carly, the evidence will show that Carly's mother had worried for years about Carly having the same mental illness that her father had. The evidence will show that Carly was very emotionally tied into her mother's emotions and that Carly never wanted her mother to worry about her. The evidence will show that Carly was scared of how her mother would react to the knowledge that if Carly had, if Carly had the same mental illness that her father had. That doesn't sound like a child that doesn't love her mom. And that doesn't sound like a child who has any intention of hurting her mother. The state would like you to believe that it's normal for her to go home from school one day with their mother, who they love, and shoot her, but nothing's wrong. It was just marijuana. Or because she was on social media and her mom didn't want her on social media. But again, we ask you to retain your common sense and to retain your good judgment because we know that just doesn't make sense. And at the end of this trial, if the state's case still leaves you feeling like their version of events just doesn't make sense, then you must return a verdict of not guilty. So that's the end of the opening statements. And, you know, I got to say, 
it definitely sounds more like if you just listen to opening statements, it definitely sounds more like a snap than a, you know, horrible deranged kid. Like we've watched other trials like Chandler Halderson and some other ones where it's like this kid was doing all sorts of stuff, kept getting in trouble, kept getting angry at his parents. And one day he did this to them and snapped just because you snap and do this to your parents doesn't mean it's an insanity defense, by the way, usually an insanity defense would be something completely out of character, out of nowhere for no real reason. Something happens whether it's a medication change, mental health illness spike because of something, um, you've you know gone without sleep for days, uh, you know somebody has done something to you to make you snap, whatever it may be. Like there are different things where it's not just like everything built up and you snap. That's not insanity. So which was this? Right? Had something been going on? Does this make sense that she would want to do something like this, or is this completely out of character? And did something else happen in her life that changed her mental makeup or something that was going on in her head? to make her not understand right from wrong, not understand what she was doing in the moment, not understand the consequences of her actions. And usually we need an expert to, des to describe that. But how these cases go is first, the state has to prove that she committed the crime, that she committed the act just because it's an insanity defense doesn't mean automatically that happens. So that's what the state's beginning case in chief. There's always a big rebuttal case, right? So the state's first case in chief is proving that Carly committed the act. That's what they did. They did it very well. Officers testified, um, the ME testified that that's how she passed away was from gunshot, um, body cam footage of finding the stepdad, you know, laying on the ground and treating his wounds, finding Carly, seeing her admit it, getting the gunshot residue, bullets match, mom's firearm, you know, all of that lined up, no doubt about it. Not even a lot of fight from the defense. Um, they did pick apart the investigation a little bit, how they didn't do a great job, or maybe uh, there was one officer that was called to the stand that um, the defense actually called in their case in chief who turned off his body cam or muted it and then covered it up. And he said it was about personnel, which is total BS. The defense is like, you were talking about that. She didn't know her mother had passed away. And he's like, well, no, no, no. It's just about personnel. It's like, this is why you guys shouldn't be doing stuff like that. Because, you know, of course the state gets up and says, were you trying to conceal or hide anything? No, 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 of course not. You weren't doing anything wrong, right? No, no, no. Defense has the policies and procedures. So like it says, you absolutely should not do exactly what you did. Is that correct? He's like, well, yes, but I still think it was okay because we were just talking about personnel and somebody not being available. And it's like, dude, that's the problem. That's the problem is they just break the rules and it doesn't matter. Policies and procedures be damned. It's like, who cares? Well, we weren't doing anything wrong. Just trust us. That's what this cop says. But regardless, I'm not sure how big of a deal it was because again, Carly admitted doing the actual act. State lines all that up. We're not going to listen to a lot of that testimony. Um, but I did want to play um, some of the dad, the stepfather's testimony. Um, so on day two, he testified for the state. And a lot of it was just how great Carly was, how sweet of a kid she was. They didn't, she, she didn't give them very many problems. She didn't cheat. She was so smart. Um, she skipped fourth grade. Uh, they had a great relationship. The ex husband and father basically is the main villain of the story. He was abusive, mental health illnesses. Carly was scared. Mom was scared. That's why she had the firearm. Um, she did have some depression issues earlier on, but it was nothing major. They thought they were dealing with it. Uh, and then he describes what happened the day that his wife was shot and he comes home and he was shot at. And what he saw from his perception, I got it. I'm just telling you like, this is not normal or usual. Cause usually the person passes away. So they can't come testify. Maybe her mom would say the same thing. We don't know. Cause her mom is no longer with us, but the dad is. And listen to how he describes Carly in that moment and remembering what the insanity defense is, right? That you don't really understand right from wrong or what you're doing or the consequences of your actions or that what you're doing is criminal. Um, you know, you just, you don't get what's going on and it's not from voluntary intoxication, meaning you're not drunk or you didn't choose to take drugs. And that's why you're hallucinating because you chose to take recreational drugs. Hold on a second. I said she was boost the audio a little. Um, how did Carly appear to you when you walked in? I said she was. She just. My initial thoughts were she was terrified, scared out of her mind. I still, to this day, don't think she ever even recognized me. Uh, something was wrong there. I don't know what, but something was off. She was there. Something was off. Something was wrong. I don't know what it was. Something was off. And she did not recognize me. Those are very important factors for the insanity defense. When I'm hearing that, I'm like, oh, 
wow. Okay, maybe they are going to find that she's legally not responsible if even the victim, when looking at her in that moment, was like, that's not Carly. Carly, it's me, dad. And she still does this, and I could tell something was off, something was wrong, it wasn't her, she was not recognizing me. And when you walked into the house, did Carly say anything to you? No, just was screaming. Did she say anything in response to your question? What's wrong? She was just screaming. No. Is that like the Carly that you had known for the past three years? No, not at all. Did Carly ever have any interest in guns? No. Um, Ashley had wanted her to <laughs> go shooting with us a time or two, and I had tried to, you know, get her to shoot a couple of different times. I think actually somebody had might, might have taken pictures the time or two that she went, but that was it. And she never was interested in going when myself and Ashley went. And in all the time that you've known Carly, would you describe her as callous? No. Would you describe her as calculating? No, except with math. Would you describe her as diabolical? No. How would you describe Carly? She's just a sweet little girl ever since I've known her. And, you know, even when we take her to the playground, instead of running around playing, <clears throat> a lot of times she would be pushing other kids on the swing and the little, I don't know what they're called, little roundabout things that kids get on and go in a circle. She'd be the one. That I'm honestly not sure he could have done better for her if he tried because he didn't seem like he was pressing. It didn't seem coach. It didn't seem fake. It seemed very genuine to me. He answered questions for the state, gave good information for the state to prove that she actually committed the, the act. Um, but I mean, it seemed incredibly genuine to me, a plus star witness for the defense, even more than the expert. And be pushing groups of kids rather than her play. And she'd go find the younger ones to try to help take care of them. And she just sweet. And are you aware of any medication Carly had been placed on? She, and I can't remember the names of which ones, which she had been placed on one by the therapist that they had started her on something. And do you recall what that medication was for? Whatever they thought it was, whether it was, I don't know, just generalized stress or depression, or I don't know what they were thinking it was. Okay. And do you recall? So to, to begin to set up the insanity defense, she had switched her medication for anxiety, depression, something general, he said. Okay, so we're starting to plant the seeds of where the defense is going to, okay? Um, and again, they talk about how they had a good relationship. He was never afraid of Carly. He still isn't afraid of Carly today. And Ashley, the mom, never appeared to be afraid of Carly either. It's, those are all very important factors. Um, and again, he talks a little bit about how it was a bad investigation. All these cops came multiple times. and They didn't notice this garage camera that was there, which... He gave them because he was forthcoming. He also talked about how, a little bit about how he felt intimidated by the cops or the state, and they basically don't like that he's still supporting Carly. Then on redirect, okay, on, on direct, I didn't feel any animosity toward the state. Thought it was just kind of normal. On redirect, though, they asked some, some very strange questions that I don't understand why or what they were really thinking when they asked, but it was, I'll, I'll just play it for you and then we'll react to it afterwards. Carly. You never saw her get mad or yell? I have never seen Carly just angry or anything. Never. No, no. She's always been just a happy little girl. Was she a happy little girl when we just heard the video when she was firing the gun at you? Like I said, I have never, I've never seen anybody like that. Even in movies, she was not herself. And like I said, I do not believe she even recognized me. She was. So she's walking into this and what she wants to say is, Oh, you, you're really saying you never saw her angry, which I get it. I mean, if you really want to go there, it's like, I'm sure you saw your kid angry. I've seen my kids angry. Um, and then she's like, was she angry the day of the shooting? And he's like, honestly, she was not herself. So you're kind of, it's almost like you're proving my point. Something happened. She wasn't herself. I've never seen anybody even in movies. Again, he gives a great answer, but then the prosecutor presses even more. I was terrified. You have a leg under 
regret uh, when I asked you about uh, medications. You actually didn't handle Harley's prescriptions or medications, right? No, Ashley was making sure she was taking them. <clears throat> I want to talk to you, uh, Mr. Smiley. You said that. Um, and there were other times where she asked questions, you know, kind of like that, like, oh, she wasn't angry about the day shots. And he's like, yeah, okay. And it just, they press even more and redirect. I did not think it went very well for the state on redirect. I thought the direct was fine. Um, then they call more witnesses, experts, GSR people, again, just proving up the case. But I did want to play it and we'll play it in two times speed just to make it less uh, real life ish. Um, because some people may not want um, to have it feel too much like real life, but just to give you an idea. Okay. So they walk in the house, she takes out the dogs um, exactly like the state described. Dogs are all kind of walking around. You see her walk and it's kind of quick, but you see her walk with something behind her back. Okay. She checks the corner, clearly holding something behind her back. You're going to hear three pops then you're going to see her come back in again, concealing the firearm from the. You don't hear any real, you know, screaming on Carly's part. She comes back in, conceals the firearm, sits down, texts somebody. Uh, this is probably where she's texting, you know, her friends to come help her. Um, and then when she gets up again, she conceals the firearm again from the camera that she knows is there in the kitchen, no doubt about it. Now, looking at her here, looks normal, looks fine, not freaking out. Doesn't look like somebody from a movie. Doesn't look like somebody who's just snapped. But the defense has already kind of brought this up in their opening that this is the invisible illness. You can't always see it. You don't always know when and how mental illness is affecting somebody. Um, then at the end of the day, which a lot of people, I think this was kind of one of the main reasons you guys reached out to me about this case is you're like very weird legal ruling. I don't know what the heck the judge is doing. It's almost sounds like he was telling the state to, um, file an appeal. So the state gets up and is asking to strike the defense expert, which in this kind of a case is basically the whole case. Why the heck are you doing this now? This is something that should have been done before. And the defense could have either gotten another expert or they could have talked to the expert more to clarify so that their whole case isn't just blown up. You can't do that to a defendant, but the state waited till now and they have kind of a pretty good argument. So let's see how the judge dealt with it. But this is at the end of day two of trial. Okay. I think it might even be after the state rested. Is the fact that he used as a source of information a video interview with Heath Smiley from August the 31st for 90 minutes um, when we had a Zoom call with Dr. Clark? He said that that nor his interview with Ms. Gregg was recorded, and so at this point we have no way of knowing what Mr. Smiley conveyed to him and how much of that he relied upon uh, in his interview that wasn't turned over to us prior to uh, August the 30th. And then additionally, Dr. Clark rendered some opinion. That's not a great argument. You know, we don't really know what they talked about because the judge is going to be like, "Didn't you have an opportunity to interview this expert?" They say yes. But there is, there is an argument I think is good that's coming up. Is, um, ...of some sort and says, and I'm looking at page 29 of his report, Your Honor. Um, do you have a copy of that? The report I have is only 24 pages. 24, I'm sorry, 24, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, in that first paragraph on the last page, he says, it's my opinion with the Lexapro that she began taking clearly worsens her pre-existing psychiatric disorder. Leaving back on the last page, he says... I'm going to slow it down just so we can hear what she's reading because this is kind of the important part of his opinion. And this is when he's talking about the medication specifically and how it affects the insanity defense and how it affected Carly Gregg that day. It's my opinion with the Lexapro that she began taking clearly worsens her pre-existing psychiatric disorder. Leaving The Lexapro she was taking clearly worsened her pre-existing psychiatric disorders. Her in a highly precocious state but there is inadequate information available to attribute a direct ca casualty to the medication. And we believe. But then he also says there's inadequate information to causally connect a direct casualty to that medication. So he's like, I think the Lexapro made her worse, but there's inadequate information for me to be sure that doesn't rise to the level of an expert opinion. In my opinion, it's like, he's, he's telling us he doesn't have enough information. So if he doesn't have enough information, how are we going to let the jury decide that? We're going to let the jury just make up their own stuff, thinking of medications and kind of throwing this stuff together. I kind of agree with the state that that's not, that shouldn't be the basis of an expert opinion. Now, if this expert got struck, the defense could try to go get another expert. 
Um, and again, if the state wanted to call this guy to impeach him and say, well, you said it wasn't enough. This guy said it was whatever, but the defense still would have had the opportunity to get another expert or talk to him to clarify what did he actually mean, whatever to do additional work, which is why you have to do this before trial. You can't do this on day two of trial. Now it seems like based on what the judge is about to say, maybe there were some late disclosures here from the defense and kind of everybody's messing up in this case, but you're going to hear how the judge says and how he makes his decision and why he makes his decision in a literal abundance of caution. This is like, this is like prototypical or stereotypical or the biggest illustrative way of an abundance of caution in favor of the defendant's rights is what we're about to see unfold here. That that would certainly, he cannot testify. His opinion is that he cannot say that the medicine caused her to behave in any way. And so we do not think it would be proper for him to be able to take the stand and to discuss that when in fact he says himself that he cannot attribute it to the medication. Uh, we'd ask that he be limited in that he not be able to talk about the Lexapro uh, and or since he did not reference it in this part, uh, the Zoloft um, that <clears throat> Ms. Gregg had allegedly taken at some point and any cause or connection to her state of mind at the time of the murder, attempted murder and tampering. As I recall, what the court was faced with was several late discovery disclosures, and the maybe the expert had not been retained until long after, until a few days after the discovery deadline. However, uh, I believe I gave the state a continuance, or, or I said I went into the box procedure. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, did you have an opportunity? So he's like, yes, he was late disclosed, but I gave you more time if you needed more time. And again, I didn't follow this case pre-trial, but it sounds like what the judge is saying is defense was late turning over this expert, but I made sure you had enough time to interview him, talk to him, see if there were any issues. Why didn't you bring me these issues then? You knew about this, you had this report and you had the opportunity to interview him. To interview Dr. Clark. We had a Zoom conversation uh, where Mr. Kent was present, where we asked him about um, the sources that he relied upon, um, asked him if he had relied upon any interview with Ms. Vicki Breland. He said he had an interview with her, but it was not referenced in her report. And so he said he did not, um, he must not have relied upon her interview. Um, he said that Keith Smiley's Zoom recording interview uh, was, I'm sorry, Zoom interview was not recorded and that no one else was present. Um, and Your Honor, we asked him uh, somewhat about what his standard was. Uh, we cleared up the fact that both he and Mr. Camp had said that they would not be talking about an involuntary intoxication. And so Mr. Camp stated that on the record. Uh, he, Dr. Clark said, well, I, I talk about the medicine, but I'm not saying that's a legal standard about involuntary intoxication. And so judge, I, I think it's improper when he says for, he cannot render an opinion. Mr. Camp said he's not gonna talk about involuntary intoxication. So it would just serve to confuse the jury rather than offer any probative value. So involuntary intoxication is you didn't voluntarily get intoxicated, meaning you didn't drink alcohol or take drugs that put you in a state of mind that then caused your insanity. They're also not going to talk about involuntary, meaning your medication caused your temporary insanity that you didn't know mixing these pills that we talked about in the beginning, that neither one of them are really going to blame it on that. So why are we bringing up these medications and when she flipped from one medication to the next? The dad has already kind of brought them up. I believe the state asked those questions. Will the experts be able to bring them up and discuss it? Because if they're not going to be able to, to a reasonable degree of medical probability or certainty, say that that affected this or created this problem, why are we putting it in front of the jury? And, and to understand why we don't want to put unreliable things in front of the jury, we don't want to make a decision based off something that could be completely wrong. And if the doctor says, I can't say it to a reasonable degree of medical probability, then the jury shouldn't consider it. They shouldn't consider it as the answer. It's like a lot of times we have cases where we redact some of the medication from like an ER visit, because if they see that somebody takes some pill and this person's mom takes that pill and they know a side effect could be X, Y, or Z, but it has nothing to do with our case. No doctor says it has anything to do with our case. We'll redact it because we don't want the jury to be like, oh, wait, wait, wait. I see they're taking this medication. So I'm going to make my decision on that medication, which is completely irrelevant to our case. We'll redact it out. So that's what they're trying to do is like, we don't need to bring this stuff up or make it seem like the reason for insanity. If in fact, nobody's going to testify to the fact that it is. And I agree with them, but I don't agree with their timing. Value at this point. Anything No, no sir.
you know, I'm not a hundred percent understanding what 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 she's uh, on the last paragraph says in Carly's case, in my opinion, the next pro that she began taking clearly worsened her pre-existing psychiatric disorders. Don't want that part in. Yeah, so I, I think that sure seems like an opinion, right? And they want that part in. So if this judge overrules the state's objections, that's coming in. That it clearly worsened her pre-existing psychiatric condition. It's part, he's, and, and I think, and they, they ask him about it. He's not saying, I think it's part of the whole, his diagnosis of what he did, but it is not saying that's what it, what it was if I, if I gather it right, Your Honor. But the next, <laughs> the, the, the comma, so to speak, is, but there is inadequate information available to attribute a direct causality to that medication. Yes. I mean, I don't, I don't love that in an expert report, if I'm being honest. He's like, here's my opinion, but I don't have enough information to confirm that. Then why did you say that's your opinion? So I don't love it. It's kind of confusing. Again, I would have tried to clarify with my expert is like, is it or is it not? Because if it's not, why'd you put it in there? If it is, why'd you put the second part of the sentence after the comma in there? And that's what he's going to, that is my understanding is he's going to say there's not a direct uh, showing that that's what that, that she, that that specifically caused it. That is these other things, you know. And, and also, this is one thing I'm saying. You put down a, you, you told us that we had to have this done by last Friday. You gave them an extension to go over this. They talked to the uh, doctor, our expert. Um, they said they're not going to have a Dahlberg hearing, which is what this, what this is. And then all of a sudden, well, the afternoon before, we, on, that's not a Dahlberg hearing. It's not specifically Dahlberg, but it is an issue with the expert that absolutely should have been handled beforehand. A Dahlberg hearing is on his qualifications uh, and, and on the side. All right. All right. Any further response? No, you're not. Reply. This judge doesn't seem super pumped about this. Again, just that we believe the motion and is proper as this statement and any testimony about this would just fly in the face of the four and three. There's no prejudice value and it was prejudice dependent. Uh, and at this point, it's not relevant. And we would ask that the court exclude any testimony by Dr. Clark or any, uh, any other witness at this point about uh, trying to causally relate Lexapro to anything that happened on March of 19th. Court is in a uh, course of that position. Court would agree with the state that the statement in and of itself does not rise to the to, to the level that an expert is required to testify to in the state. I agree with him. However, whether he's saying it's not causally related or not, whether or not he. He's saying there's in inadequate information available to attribute a direct, a direct causality to that medication. It is an unwritten rule in the case law of this state. There seems to be two separate standards of law. He said there's an unwritten rule in this state. Without the appellate courts ever stating that. There's one standard state is held to. And I would point out that pathologist was not called in this case because it was disclosed late. So I read the motion. You asked me to treat you like the state. Do you really want that? I guess he excluded a state witness because they were late disclosed, but he didn't exclude a defense witness because they were late disclosed. Because again, that's where the appeals come in. That's where the constitutional rights come in, the protections. The state is held to a higher standard, whether it's fair or not. They have the burden beyond a reasonable doubt. We, and all of this stems from, okay, for anybody that's going to get angry about this and him talking about the two standards, we've talked about it a lot. All of this stems from, we only want people we are sure are guilty to go to prison. Better a hundred guilty people go free than one innocent man imprisoned. And that's what he's basing this on. State is free to cross appeal this court's decision, and it probably should. However, this court has little faith. The state could cross appeal this and probably should. So we know there are only certain rare circumstances the state can appeal if it loses a trial, and this is potentially one of them, depending on how it all comes out. That uh, this court excluding a witness, even though he was disclosed, hired far past the discovery deadline. And even though the vast majority of the opinion appears to be improper, 
Um, so even though he was disclosed late, which he could have struck him for that, but he didn't, which they never do. And even though the vast majority of his opinions are improper, which he could strike him for that. Sounds like he's not gonna. I'll tell you whether or not I disagree with that. Diminished capacity type evidence. And even though it does not rise to the standard, the court's going to overrule the state's objection. Courts and trial courts in the state are in a bad position. There are too many reversals when we exclude what is deemed to be the defendant's case. And I'm just gonna be frank that this is and, and he's right that. This is the defendant's case. So if he was going to strike this witness in its entirety, it basically ends the case for the defendant, especially because we've already presented this stuff to the jury. The jury expects to hear from experts. They expect to hear certain things. That's the other problem is they've already done opening statements. They've already made promises to the jury that now if those promises aren't going to be kept because the state didn't wait to bring it up until now, that is unfair as well. This is not a case uh, that this court wants to see again. However, the defendant is raising an insanity defense that opens the doors wide open to a lot of things. Um, of course, it's going to overrule the state's objection. I'm going to allow the expert to testify to a late disclosed report that basically talks about diminished capacity and does not make the standard of care, does not make the burden of proof required in the state. Wow. He's going to overrule the state's objection, let this expert testify to everything, even though it was late disclosed, and it doesn't even rise to the level of expert testimony. Wow. That's like, that's a shocker. It's a shocker. I'll tell you whether I agree with it after he's done. However, it's all in the defendant's favor. This is a situation where you're saying, listen, it is what it is, um, but I always want to err on the favor of the defendant's side. And, you know, if the state still wins, the defendant has lost all these good arguments for appeal. Okay. Respect it, I guess. I hope the state cross appeals. There's a verdict in this case. I'm invited. I hope the state cross appeals again. He's what he what, what he means there. People were saying, like, why would he ever tell the state he hopes they appeal? If he's wrong, he wants to be overturned. This is not a guy with an ego. He's like, I'm trying to make the right decision. I'm erring on the side of the defendant. If I'm wrong, appeal and somebody will correct me. And I hope the interests of justice are um pursued here. Thank you to cross appeal. I'm inviting the Supreme Court to tell me I'm wrong. Uh, it was I'm begging the Supreme Court to tell me I'm wrong. If they are, I'll know how to handle it in other cases. Law. Says I should, I, I, I'm okay excluding it, but there's too many cases out there that have been on the edges that they will reverse. Um, I'll be frank, there would be an opinion that came out and said, Well, it's substantial, came close enough. So, uh, for those reasons, I'm, he's like, There's an opinion. I've read opinions where they say, Well, it was close enough, so you should have let it in for the defendant. I'm going to deny it. Jury chooses to return an NGRI on this evidence, then, then that's going to be their decision. NGRI is not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, they choose to acquit her on this evidence, that, that's their decision. But I'm going to allow the uh, expert to testify and the state to continue with this on cross examination to the best of its ability. Feel free to cross appeal, uh, regardless of verdict. Regardless of verdict, feel free to cross appeal. Um, like, please appeal, even if you win, appeal. Because I want to know what the answer is. And again, they're still allowed to bring up the fact that he said there's inadequate information for me to really connect this. They're going to be able to bring that in, blow a hole through him um, uh, on cross-examination and really hit at his testimony and how reliable it is and how good it actually is and how accurate it actually is. They're still going to be able to do all that. They're still going to be able to cross-examine and nitpick and go at him for what's in his report. But he is going to be able to testify about this in front of the jury, which they didn't want. So... Uh, let me just hit. So, so one other thing I want to say to so the defense in their case in chief calls the dad again, talks about how great everything was great. The relationship was then on cross. This is where I was saying they, they go in even more. They push even more on the dad with these seemingly bad questions, in my opinion, where they're like, uh, well, you, you realize we won't ever get to see Ashley again because of what Carly did. And he's like, yes. It's like, that's, that's his wife. Trust me. He cares more than you do, right? Like that, that's his, I mean, we don't know if they had issues or whatever, but just seemingly he cares more than you do state. Like, what are you trying to do with that? I don't think that looks good at all to do that to a victim in your case. He is literally a victim in their case and one of their witnesses. Um, and then, okay. So now I'll get to, do I think the judge made the right decision? Absolutely made the right decision, not striking him because the, uh, disclosure was late. That would have been horrible. 
absolutely made the right decision, giving the state more time to do an interview and anything they needed to do to basically get rid of the prejudice that that late disclosure caused. I disagree with the judge's call to just let him testify to everything that doesn't even rise to an expert opinion. I would never have struck him in his entirety, but what I would have done is probably say, you can't testify to whether or not that medication had any effect at all. You can testify to the trauma. You can testify to the PTSD. You can testify to the, um, what is it that he explains? Intrusive thoughts and things like that. Like you can testify about all of that, but you can't testify about how the medication affected anything in this case, because you said you do not have enough. I would have, I would have carved out part of his testimony. I would have had no problem doing that as a judge to just let him testify to all of it is wild to me when you know, or believe as a judge that it does not even rise to the standard. And we're still going to just put it in front of this jury. I think there are ways you could have carved it out. You wouldn't have made the defense team liars in opening statement. You could have let him get into it. The dad has already talked about the fact that she switched medications. So if you want to maybe argue that as a point in your argument as the defense, okay, maybe, but the state can say no expert testified to that. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think he really just shoved it all in favor of the defense, which if you're going to err on one side, I do believe that's where you should err. But so the expert testimony is coming in about that. So let's get to that expert testimony now. Dr. Clark, based on your evaluation and the records you reviewed, what were your overall impressions of Carly's personality and development? So my overall impressions were that Carly... This is after he, of course, went through his background and talked about what he reviewed. He talked about how he interviewed Carly for four hours, the stepdad for 90 minutes. The stepdad is overly helpful. I'm sure there's going to be some people that think there's some nefarious reason for that. And maybe the jury will too. You guys let me know in the comments if you think, I don't know, if you think some negative feelings about the dad for helping Carly, I think that's what the prosecutor's doing. I don't think it's landed in any of the questions that they've asked. They have definitely not pointed the finger at him. So if they think he did anything, they're not saying it outright. They're just kind of vaguely asking him some questions that I personally don't think are landing. Maybe you guys disagree, but here's where he's going to kind of explain the trauma and what Carly has been through. He was a young teenage girl who loved school, was bright, I think enjoyed the fact that she was bright, loved reading books, loved thinking big thoughts, that she was a, a loyal and generous friend, that she may have been something of a follower rather than a leader, that she was generally energetic, she was involved in many activities, that she had a, a, a close, although somewhat complicated relationship with her mother and a close affectionate relationship with her stepfather. And that she had a close affectionate relationship with her stepfather sounds a little weird, but cause she's like a teenager. Um, but I don't know if there's anything to take from that. I don't know if the jury will take anything from that. Much more problematic relationship with her biological father. And who we know is the villain of the story. And when they get to the drama, I'm sorry, the trauma, um, he is a big part of it. What if anything were you able to gauge about Carly's having any behavioral issues or history of behavioral issues? So it was my impression that Carly had, to a very large extent, always been well-behaved, was a dutiful girl, sought to do well in school, sought to please her mother by doing well in school, um, and then in the last perhaps year, um, developed some what I took to be relatively um, 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 common teenage behaviors, such as staying up past curfew on a burner phone to text with friends, for example. And you got to be careful when you talk about whether it's normal bad behavior for a teenager versus something that would lead you to believe she has a mental illness and they're kind of towing the line of almost both. It seems like, so the jury is going to have to differentiate, Oh, she was just a normal kid, you know, smoking weed, uh, texting people at night that she wasn't supposed to breaking curfew. Uh, okay. But then he's also going to use some of that stuff to say mental health issues are there. So I think it's kind of interesting. And there's, there's more details here that I think maybe there were some red flags. Well, I think one, on one occasion, she snuck out at night after curfew to go visit a friend. Um, and then, and then, um, uh, in addition, in the last perhaps six weeks prior to the arrest, she began smoking marijuana. What if any past history of trauma did Carly have? So Carly had had a somewhat difficult childhood in a couple of different ways. One is that she had a younger sister who died of a medical illness when Carly was about four years of age. And the younger sister was about 18 months of age. And Carly reported to me that that was hard for her. She remembered it happening and it was difficult for her. Secondly, her parents divorced when she was around four or five years of age. She reported to me that she remembered a lot of arguing and that she recalled having seen her mother having been um, um, bruised or injured by her father because it was domestic violence, although she never witnessed it directly. She told me that um, her mother had informed her um, that the father had beaten her. 
and she told me that she recalled she and her mother leaving late at night um, uh, in, uh, as, as, as the parents separated. She told me that. Absolute trauma. No doubt about that. Nobody's going to argue with that. Did it lead to mental health issues? Was it biological from the father? Um, is that some kind of proof that she was temporarily insane at the time that she committed this crime? Those are all much bigger questions, but no doubt, definitely trauma in her past. That she, and it's my understanding as well from records that Carly had court ordered visitation with her father about every other week, but that that was difficult, that she found her father to be um, angry, unreliable. Um, uh, at times he would just sit in a chair all day long and not speak to her, that at times he wouldn't help her get food or fluid. Uh, and there was one incident in particular when she was around six years of age, when something the father had done frightened her and she ran and hit under the bed. And this was an incident that uh, um, um, continued to bother her. She also told me that her father was a dangerous and scary driver and it was hard, it was scary for her to keep driving with him. What, if anything, did you learn about Carly's educational history? So what I learned was that Carly was always a good student, um, that she worked hard, that she got good grades, that she scored quite high on standardized testing, and that she had skipped the fourth grade. Um, and she reported to me that she really enjoyed or appreciated having skipped because she thought she found the, I guess, the fifth grade that she went into more challenging academic. Again, as per usual, excelled in school, although he said a, always a good student. He didn't make it quite seem as genius level as some of the other witnesses. Um, but he does talk about the fact that she brought a knife to school once, which I was like, we just kind of gloss over that. He's like, but it was a Swiss army knife, no big deal. And she went to this, um, what did he call it? A transition school. And she helped teach the class there because she was so smart. Um, and a therapist that she talked to ended up thinking like, ah, oh, it was a, it was much ado about nothing. Mm, I think it depends, right? How you characterize bringing a knife to school. I'm not positive. Um, I would just say it's much ado about nothing. Maybe I'm being overly sensitive based on recent events that we've been talking about on the channel, but enough to send her to a transitional school. Um, she has trauma in her past. This is far from, I think some of the picture that the defense has been painting of her, right. Um, which I think is helpful to their defense, but I am just kind of getting confused. Are they trying to tell me she had a lot of issues as a child or that she was completely normal and nothing was wrong? Cause this guy almost starts to talk about it both ways, but really he's saying she was putting on a good face for the world and for her parents, but she was really dealing with all this down below. That's, I think, what he's trying to um, discuss here, but at certain parts, it gets a little uh, confusing. He says she has PTSD from this trauma, and by the way, this guy met with her for four hours. He's got all sorts of diagnoses for her, um, and of course, he is a defense expert, so make of that what you will. Uh, let's jump ahead a couple minutes here. Mental health struggles your evaluation about when did Carly's parents learn that Carly had been engaging in cutting? So I think it really wasn't until December of 2023. So just last December that Carly's parents learned, as I understand it, she had been cutting fairly regularly for about two years before her parents found out. Were there any other behaviors that her parents learned around December of 2023? So the other behaviors that the parents learned about at that time was that Carly had um, um, been using a, I think an old iPad or an old iPod perhaps to text with friends. And I think with a boyfriend, quote unquote boyfriend, um, um, after hours uh, to be doing this, of course, without her parents' knowledge or consent and Carly's parents found, found out about it. What if any issues had Carly begun to experience with sleeping at the time? So Carly began to develop sleep difficulties from the summer of 2023, and she reported, uh, and, and Mr. Smiley confirmed to me as well, um, uh, that um, she had trouble falling asleep and that she would often wake up. And also, by the way, different jurisdictions and different judges allowed different experts to really regurgitate a lot of information from the defendant. He is regurgitating basically everything good that they would need that Carly reported to him, and it's allowable in this jurisdiction by this judge and so there's really no reason for her to testify because of his testimony, which some jurisdictions, that's an absolute no-no. In the middle of the night. And she began to take melatonin um, um, to try to help with that. And I think by the fall of 2023, found that the single five milligram dose of melatonin that she took um, wasn't enough. And so she would sometimes take a second melatonin tablet to make, to make 10 milligrams. And is that harmful to take two melatonin tablets? You know, the dosing of melatonin is pretty broad. It's not uncommon for people to take 10 milligrams. Some people take one milligram. I'm not, I'm not sure there's much data to support it, but it's not particularly harmful to do. But I know that her mother was concerned about it, and her mother began to hold the melatonin and give Carly just a single pill. Regulatory agencies are particularly concerned about the last before. So after Carly's parents found out that she was cutting herself and um, um, staying up late using this burner phone, I, I'll tell you, in addition, the other thing that happened around that time was that Carly reported to them that she was feeling depressed and that she thought she needed help as well. So really those three things happened. And in response, Carly's mother sought out uh, both therapy and a medication evaluation. Carly's mother contacted the pediatrician, the pediatrician made a referral. Carly had an evaluation uh, initially at, at Precise Clinical uh, with a prescriber. Uh, and then shortly after that, first her first uh, session with a, a new therapist, Rebecca Kirk. What 
was the course of Carly's treatment between January of 2024 and March of 2024? So there were two parallel treatments going on. One was the psychotherapy, right? So Carly was seen every week by Rebecca Kirk. And Carly reported to me that she really liked Rebecca Kirk. She found her good to talk to, compassionate. She liked, she liked her. She had not liked her therapist when she was younger, but she liked Rebecca Kirk. She felt that she, she could be open to her. And so they met every week. In addition to that, Carly met with a prescriber early in January and was begun on antidepressant medication. So the prescriber at Precise Clinical diagnosed Carly with major depressive disorder, which is the psychiatric term for depression, as well as adjustment disorder, and started the medication Zoloft. So now they start to get into the medication, the diagnosis other people um, diagnosed her for, and now we're getting closer to the events. So it's within the months leading to this insane break that the defense is trying to prove. Um, and there are other professionals other than him that have diagnosed her with major depressive disorder, et cetera. What is an adjustment disorder? So adjustment disorder simply means that an individual, it's a, I'll just bash it back up and say, it's a DSM-5 diagnosis. DSM-5 is sometimes called the Bible of psychiatry. All the official diagnoses are in DSM-5. Um, and so adjustment disorder is- He basically says, this is when they can't figure out what else it is they use this. Broad category. In this case, depression, not just feeling, but in the world of psychiatry, depression really is an illness and it tends to affect not just your, I guess your emotional state, but it can affect your sleep. It can affect your energy, your ability to concentrate, sometimes your appetite, um, um, your ability just to enjoy things. Um, people will sometimes feel like just their whole body has slowed down. Uh, and then not uncommonly, people might uh, become suicidal when depression uh, uh, gets, gets, gets bad enough. So it's really considered to be a psychiatric illness. And it's often the case that individuals who are diagnosed with major depressive disorder that are prescribed psychiatric medication and antidepressants in particular to try to treat it. You mentioned that Carly was first put on Zoloft. Do you recall the dosage that she started on? I do. Um, so, so Zoloft is also known as sertraline, which is the generic name. It's, a, it's an SSRI, ser specific serotonin reuptake inhibitor medication. It's an antidepressant. Uh, and she was initially, and it's widely used in, in, in teenagers. Um, and she was given the dose of 25 milligrams initially. And how did that medication seem to affect Carly? It didn't seem to have much effect at all. I will say it's a low dose. It's a low dose. Um, um, and so, so in the first month or so, Carly took it and reported that it didn't really make much difference one way or the other. What was, so what if any course of treatment was changed at that point? So in, in February, Carly had a follow-up visit um, with the clinician from Precise Clinical and reported that Zoloft wasn't doing very much at that dose. And so the clinician raised the dose from 25 to 50 milligrams. And I will say that's a perfectly standard dose. These are relatively low dose. The, 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 the sort of the standard dose for Zoloft is 50 to 200 milligrams. That's usually the range where people end up. Folks will often start at 25 milligrams just to kind of go slowly and be gentle, but it's not at all uncommon for, for an adolescent to end up at 50 milligrams fairly soon. So I don't know much about these types of medications. Um, I don't know how they really affect children. I've heard some stories and had some cases on how they affect adults certain times. It seems like a lot. And I don't know if this is the defense is doing on purpose, but like, it seems like a lot's going on. Medication doses are changing, mixing things with other things she's taking like melatonin or marijuana or whatever it may be. Um, uh, problems that she's having. He mentions voices in her head, men mental illnesses getting worse. Uh, the changes in meds, the changes in treatment, all these different types of medications and doses to me, sounds like a lot for a kid, for a child. Um, so I think that that's maybe a problem that um, the defense is putting before the jury to consider as what effect did all this have and is he going to be able to land the plane based on his report? I don't know. And how did that dosage of Zoloft affect Carly? So Carly reported both to me and to the clinician that at the 50 milligram dose, she felt numb. She felt as if she wasn't able to really experience much pleasure or feel her emotions very much. She reported that it didn't really help that much with depression, but it really left her kind of flat in a way that was um, um, uh, that was unpleasant for her. Um, and I will say that's a, that's a very common reaction. I feel as if I, I see that quite frequently. Do you remember the term Carly used for how it made her feel? Zombied was the term. And what if any medication was... So that's also important, right? She started to feel numb. She felt zombied. These are the types of turns... I'm sorry, of terms that are used when you start to get to that level that you're a different person, you don't know what's going on, you get in these funks because of the medication, even though they said they're not gonna argue involuntary uh, intoxication, it's just, it's very strange, it's very, very interesting. Carly changed too, after so long. So at the follow-up visit on March 12th with Precise Clinical, she reported feeling numb, and the clinician then uh, changed her medication um, with, to a one called Lexapro or escitalopram. It's another SSRI medication. And I will say that it's actually quite common for someone to do poorly on one SSRI and better on another. We don't have the ability to identify upfront ahead of time who's going to respond to which medication. And there can be a lot of very individual variability. So somebody might, some one person might respond well to Prozac and badly to Zoloft. And the next person might respond well to Zoloft and badly to, badly to, to Prozac. And it's a, a fair amount of trial and error that's often involved. And so the clinician at that point in time on March 12th, prescribed five milligrams of Lexapro, the relatively small dose, 
and instructed Carly to lower the Zoloft down to 25 milligrams for 10 days and then to stop. In fact, Carly told me that she just stopped the Zoloft um, um, cold turkey, I guess, wait. Cold turkey's not quite, not quite the right term because she didn't have withdrawal symptoms, but she stopped the Zoloft abruptly on March 12th because she didn't want to take it anymore. And maybe she didn't quite. So she hated it so much that she stopped it even quicker, didn't wean herself off it like the doctors um, told her to. So again, Doses changing, medication changing, not weaning off appropriately, building a story of, you can understand somebody that's dealing, and he's going to go through even more diagnosis. He says he diagnosed her as bipolar. Her dad was bipolar. She has um, intrusive thoughts. She has PTSD. She has um, dissociation, all sorts of issues and things he's going to talk about her going through. They're really throwing a lot out there for this jury to consider for this young kid who committed a horrible act but is it fitting into the perfect box of not guilty by reason of insanity? Is the jury going to believe it and buy it? Quite understand the instruction. So starting either on March 12 or maybe the next day, Carly was on only the five milligrams of Lexapro. And was there a point in time when a, uh, when a prescriber had mentioned trying to put Carly on Prozac? I believe that at the initial visit with Precise Clinical, what they reported in their records was that Ashley, um, Miss Smiley, told them that when she was younger, she had been put on Prozac and she'd become suicidal quite immediately. And so really did not want Carly on Prozac. So her mom had been put on Prozac and became suicidal. So she didn't want to use that. And again, is that going to bring in another biological component, not just from her biological father? How did Carly's personality begin to change at school after her dosage changed? Um, after her dosage After her medication changed. Um, then they talk about, you know, how her personality started changing at school and it wasn't the same and everything was starting to be different from her. Um, they talked about how her dad was bipolar. She was scared of being bipolar. He considered it a high risk of being bipolar. And again, he diagnosed her with bipolar disorder, asked her if she had certain feelings that fit into that box. Um, asked about how her parents couldn't know she's really good at hiding it. She was always worried about her mom's emotional state. She minimized her symptoms. He even talked about at one point, was she malingering or kind of making up some of these voices in her head stuff, um, which we're going to hear a little bit about, but <clears throat> uh, for her case. And he determined that she wasn't because she would have led with it, eh, I guess. Um, let me see. She answered yes. Could you answer question? Could you read question number 13 for me? In the past month, did you do something repeatedly without being able to resist doing it? It's really, it's really not that bad. A lot of I think, teenagers in particular, again, are worried that their parents are going to find out. Um, and it's actually still fairly common for people to be worried that they're going to end up uh, in a psychiatric hospital, if they're, if they're, uh, especially around things like suicide. I'm talking about suicidal thoughts, but just in general, they worry that, that you're just going to. So Carly had kept the journal. Uh, it's, it looked like it began in January. Of All right. So here we go. Now I want to get to the journal entry. It began in January. This is March 12th basically a week before the shooting happened. And we're going to listen to two journal entries that he's going to read here that are pretty good evidence that she was going through some stuff mentally. 2024, um, just after the, um, after she'd been found by her mother uh, to have been engaged in these behaviors, she kept the journal through much of January and then dropped off. And then this, as I recall, was the only entry in March. Um, so writing in, on March 12th, Tuesday, she writes, I think I had a psychotic break earlier. The whole ordeal was quite silly. I actually spoke with one of the voices in my head. Well, I didn't hear them until earlier today, but I only do then. My particular friend and I were practically screaming bloodthirstily and ravenously. Thank God that physical confrontation was not, and I think it's fruitably possible. I sound crazy. And then she goes on to say, I need to get back into the habit of journaling that think it's good. I haven't quite decided if I'll bring this stupid thing to Miss Kirk, Mrs. Kirk, her therapist tomorrow, but I just, ah, uh, I can't decide. Exclamation mark. Again, jury's hearing this. What are they thinking? You guys tell me. What are you thinking when you hear this? And now here's another one. Really disavowed. And could you look at the second page that I gave you there, sir? Yes. Was that also? Um, in this That's the one titled April 7th. And what about that? Uh, in 2023, 11 months before the incident. And it, she writes in here, I'm a schizophrenic person. I'm crazy. I miss the comfort in being sane. I just want to find true love. Then maybe I wouldn't be so crazy. My thoughts envelop me. I'm scared. I need help. And I'm happy to talk about it. Yes, please do. <laughs> I don't know whether this is just the writings of an emotional, somewhat dramatic teenage girl keeping the journal. It could be. 
right? So I, I don't take this as evidence that she had a thought disorder. I do think it's reasonable to think that she's worried. She was worried about her mental health at this point in time. What if anything had Carly? That was 11 months before. Um, then he talks a little bit more about medication and voices and how all that kind of fits together. At the same time, the incident, she was continued on Lexapro uh, when she came to uh, the correctional facility. They increased the dose of Lexapro um, one, 10 days after she arrived there. She continued to record auditory hallucinations. And a month later, they took her off the Lexapro. Um, and it was after that, she said the hallucinations stopped. But the other thing that happened at the same time, Carly was put on an antipsychotic medication. Called, what medication was she put on? She was put on Abilify, also known as erythiprazole. So on March 28th, she reported these auditory hallucinations. She was diagnosed with major depressive disorder with psychotic features and treated with an antipsychotic medication, Abilify. Um, and then uh, uh, in, in, in April, the dose of Abilify was increased from five to seven and a half milligrams. Uh, and the Lexapro was stopped. So those two medication changes occurred and Carly reported subsequently that the voices had gone away. What dosage, was her dosage of Abilify raised at any point again? Yes, at the time that I saw Carly in the end of August, she was on, she reported being on 10 milligrams a day of Abilify. And that's what the records would reflect starting, starting in July. And what stood out to you about that dosage? So when I first met, when I met with Carly, she told me she was on Abilify. I didn't know what dose she was on. She didn't know. She told me Abilify had been really helpful for her. Typically, in my experience with adolescents who've never been on an antipsychotic before, I'll use one or two milligrams of Abilify. It's a very, can be a very potent medication. It can be very sedating. And typically, what I see with adolescents, especially those that have not been on antipsychotics before, is they might be on two milligrams, maybe four, maybe five. Um, Carly told me, or I found out, that she was on 10 milligrams a day, um, which, which surprised me. I, I, it is rare for me to see a teenager on that high a dose, unless they've either had really significant behavioral problems and been on a lot of antipsychotics before, or they have a serious mental illness like schizophrenia. So what's he saying? He's telling the jury over medicated. That sounds like involuntary intoxication. It wasn't her idea. It's what she was prescribed. And it didn't fit for what she was going through. That's what it sounds like to me, right? Without him saying it, which is why it's problematic. There's another point in this where he says he thinks there's a biological component. That does not rise to the level of expert testimony. But the jury's hearing all of it. And what's the highest dose of Abilify? So typically 10 to 15 milligrams a day is considered the maximum dose. Abilify is an antipsychotic medication used to treat conditions like schizophrenia. Most typically, again, 10 to 15 milligrams a day. It's also used for many other things, right? It's used to help with depression. But that's, that's the basic point I wanted you to get is that that is basically near the max dose. He does explain how she misses her mother tremendously. Again, basically testifying for Carly at this point. So sorry if this feels a little disjointed, but I bit off a little more than I could chew today, trying to get a little ahead for tomorrow. It's Whitney's birthday. I have a whole day plan. I'm not going to work, not going to do any videos, anything like that. I really wanted to catch up and get through everything that has happened in this case so far, but it was a lot. So I was kind of recording this video in parts and I hadn't watched the rest of this expert's testimony until now. So it's late at night, but I still want to give you the rest of the breakdown here. Um, and we're going to jump back in as he explains again, more about the medication, more about how it affected Carly, even though none of this really seems to rise to the level of, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty or medical probability or scientific certainty or scientific probability. He doesn't testify to that once. He doesn't even say those words. They aren't necessarily magic words, but it's always nice if your expert will say it and testify to the actual proper standard. Haven't heard any of that, but the judge is just letting him go and letting him testify to this stuff. So here's a little bit more of that. I can't imagine that it would, no. And so what, if anything, did Carly tell you occurred on the Sunday prior to the incident of March 19th, which was a Tuesday? So Carly told me that she had been put on Lexapro on March 12th and that she found that almost immediately, very quickly, her mood swings were worse, that she was having lower lows and higher highs um, in that week leading up to March 19th. She told me that the voices were getting worse, that they were becoming more urgent, more insistent, uh, more of a problem for her. Um, and then she told me that on that Sunday, uh, March 17th, that she had smoked marijuana that morning, that her mother and stepfather had gone to the store. She was alone in the house. She smoked some marijuana. And that she had about a 20 minute experience where her thoughts were racing, her thoughts were jumbled. She was really frightened. Uh, and she kind of fell to the floor because she wasn't sure that she was going to be able to control her body. Um, she said it was a very scary experience for her, unlike some interviews you've had before. And that uh, um, after about 20 minutes, it passed. And then she was sort of back to herself. How can we make sense of the fact that a low dose of a widely used antidepressant could have such an impact on Carly's symptoms? So, so 
So the SSRI, SSRI medications are widely used, generally considered safe, approved by the Food and Drug Administration, um, and, and most adolescents do just fine with them. They don't always work all that well. Sometimes they do. Um, but there are a small number of individuals that have dramatically bad responses to these medications, most particularly in terms of suicidality. Right, so, these, so, so there's a small number of individuals, it's thought to be maybe one or 2% of people that take the medication, where fairly quickly, they can become quite suicidal, just kind of out of the blue. They had not been suicidal before, they're given a medication like Prozac, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden they, they get suicidal. So the Food and Drug Administration has mandated what's called a black box warning, which is that when you get your package insert from the medication, there's a thick, heavy black box that says warning. You need to be worried about, for individuals, um, um, uh, for, sorry, for adolescents from the ages of 16 to 24, you need to worry about the risk of suicidal ideation caused by this medication. For a long time, the Food and Drug Administration recommended weekly meetings with your prescriber just to, just, to, just to check in. So, and I will say in my experience, I've had many, many patients who have reported going on an SSRI medication and just having an awful response. They say, just, I just... All right. So that's kind of his explanation of how it crosses over. By the way, those big warnings usually because of lawyers, um, because they didn't warn of these side effects that are known even if it's just 2% of people, but that's neither here nor there. He also reports, she says she had memory loss um, and her friend confirms that she heard voices in her head. Um, and, you know, he talks more about the voices specifically. He starts to get to some of her diagnosis. And again, people have different opinions on, you know, how somebody can meet with somebody for one time for four hours and come up with all these different diagnoses of people, especially when we get to cross, I, I really think the state did a really good job crossing this guy but it's like all these other people in her life never diagnosed her with, you know, most of this and you meet with her for four hours and boom, you have her all figured out. And it just so happens to correlate with exactly with what her lawyers want. That's what the state's going to argue. Food disorder. Right. So I gave her the diagnosis of bipolar two. Um, and um, I saw her as having suffered from some significant depression and then some hypomanic episodes and then worsening a mood that was, mood disorder that was worsened by the Lexapro medication from March 12th onward. I also gave her the diagnosis of, it's a terrible name, other specified schizophrenia spectrum and related psychotic disorders, uh, really referring to the auditory hallucinations. So I think that I understood the voices she was hearing when she was younger as being um, notable, but not necessarily psychosis. I mean, they were there, but she didn't really seem to affect her. But I also understood that in the, certainly in the week or weeks leading up to the incident, the voices were becoming more prominent, more urgent, more of a problem. And I think it's reasonable to conclude that the voices were likely not just saying to her, oh, you're better than that guy. I think that it was in my experience and my understanding that when the voices become really urgent like that, they typically um, um, say something much more, much more concerning um, than, than, oh, you're better than that, that guy. I take, I give weight to the records from Vital Corps where Carly was reporting command auditory hallucinations um, uh, um, uh, um, shortly after she was, she was arrested. Um, I think, and I give weight to SK's testimony this morning, and I give weight to Carly's journal entry from March 12th. Um, so I'm not even sure that we've talked about. Um, all to indicate that the voices, I think, were becoming a really significant problem for her um, and likely really had crossed over into, into the domain of what I, what I would call psychosis. I so I, I'm very torn on this guy's testimony because I think he seems really smart and he's saying a lot of things that I do think that if the jury believes them can be very important and can lead them to not guilty by reason of insanity. But just knowing in my head what, what is normal as far as the standard for what an expert is to testify, he just doesn't meet it. He is willing, or he is not willing. He is being allowed to say things like, I think this, or usually the voices don't do this. They're usually a lot worse. They're not just saying something like this. I would say she went into psychosis, but none of this is to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. And so I'm thinking in my head, like, okay, you think this or that, but there's just not enough there for that. And all of this happened, or a lot of this happened after she got arrested. So to me, it's just, I think the state does a really good job crossing because there's a lot of fodder for cross, but I think there's a difference between a lot of fodder for cross and something that just shouldn't be allowed to come before a jury. And this is giving you the example of, honestly, I believe this is an example of, this is how maybe unreliable information can get to a jury and could possibly convince them. Which I'm all for the defendant's presumption of innocence, the defendant having all the rights, the defendant being protected, but there should be lines in this and the judge is the gatekeeper. And he almost agreed that this isn't reliable and doesn't meet the standard, but I'm still going to let it in. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, gosh, I want to protect the defendant's rights. But as I'm listening to this guy, I'm like, this seems like a stretch. It sounds good. And if you just believe him, he's like, oh, he thinks this, he thinks that, okay, he's an expert. He must be smart. But it's like, this really doesn't feel or sound like expert testimony to me. I think that, I don't know whether we're done with that clip. Um, he says psychosis is different from being psychotic. We'll talk more about that later. So, you know, it's one thing to be like, she snapped and wanted to kill her mom. 
It's another to be like she was in psychosis, basically. Um, he said, okay, so then he gave the other options. Sure, she could have just panicked, but she didn't panic because we watched the video together. She was way too cool, calm, and collected to just be panicked and snapped and want to kill her mom. Okay. Uh, and she could also be callous to want to kill her mom or just hated her mom or got mad at her, but that goes against everything he knows her to be. I wrote in my notes, LOL, after four hours. Like, he's he's admitting this could just be panic, this could be callous. It could be panic, like she just got so mad and she wanted to hurt her mom, and then she was panicked, but she wasn't acting panic. So then the only other real option is she's so callous and is a psychopath and, like, just didn't even care and was walking around where the camera was and just was a flat affect, but that's not her because he knows her character after meeting with her and reading some records. I don't know. Those seem like some plausible options as well. It's really going to be up to the jury to determine. He even admits it's a tough question, but his answer best fits the circumstances. Again, that does not seem or feel like the expert testimony and the standards we need in the United States. He says that her problems were much more severe than even she believes. Um, he says he does not believe she's a psychopath because of her history and how nice she's been to people. Eh, especially when earlier he's saying like, she's so good at putting on a happy face. She's so good at tricking the people around her. It's so common for the people around these people to not know that they have these issues. It's like, well, which is it? Cause those seem to be contradictory to me. Okay. Then they eventually ask him the ultimate question, which is, did she understand what she was doing? Did she know right from wrong? Uh, did she know she was committing a crime? And we'll hear him explain that. Based on your experience, expertise, and evaluation of Carly, do you believe that Carly was able to under understand the nature of her conduct and appreciate the difference between right and wrong at the time this incident occurred on March 19th? I don't think so. And based on your... FYI, I don't think so. Usually not good enough. Especially when you put in your report that there's just not enough here for you to come to a conclusion. But nonetheless... This jury might not know that, and they heard him. They heard the experts say he doesn't think so. So okay, he knows more than them, right? Your experience, expertise, and evaluation of Carly Gregg. Do you believe that she did not know or could not appreciate right from wrong on the afternoon of March 19th? I do. And do you believe she understood the nature and quality of this act on March 19th at that time? No. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that Dr. Clark's mental health evaluation be admitted into evidence. Okay. So during the afternoon break, we have yet another legal argument where the state says he did not testify to any of this to a reasonable degree of medical probability. And they have another discussion before the judge saying he didn't meet the standard. He didn't even know what the standard was. And we're going to listen to a little bit of that back and forth. This is what he ruled out, his method of evaluation, uh, how he comes to his conclusions. We went over who he talked to, what he reviewed. And that in itself, that statement is just being used as an invitation to exploit. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Um, to my recollection, uh, Dr. Clark simply testified that his best hypothesis was that's the opinion that he stated. Um, while the state of this, that the case states that you don't have to use the specific terms to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, you have to render an opinion somewhat in that line. And he hasn't stated that. The, the, the defense is right. You don't have to use the magic words of to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. But this prosecutor's right where he's saying, but like, at least has to be you as the judge, as the gatekeeper have to be like, okay, the way he testified seemed to be to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. And even the judge seems to agree that's not what it was, but will the judge change his mind and strike his entire testimony? That is so unusual to do, especially for a defense expert, especially when it's the defense's whole case. And especially after the jury's already heard all this, like, I gotta be honest, this, this doesn't usually win. That is a veto reasonable degree of medical certainty at all using any kind of terms. He certainly he just simply talked about the training and education that he used in arriving at his conclusion. Not that his conclusion itself was a reasonable degree of medical certainty or anything even close to that. And so, uh, your, your Honor, as we argued yesterday, and as the court, um, you know, deliberated back and forth with itself yesterday over whether or not to allow this testimony in, this is the exact type of diminished capacity testimony that we were bringing up yesterday. And now it's here and the jury's heard it. And the state argued that it doesn't meet standard um, under Rule 702, 703, or in the case law of the state. All right. Let's hold it in the courtroom. 
in the state, we have a long tortured history with uh, procedure. It seems that procedure changes from case to case based on who the parties are, what type of case it is. Um, and every time a case gets reversed for exclusion, it comes down to this overarching appellate court favor towards the defendant being allowed to put forth the theory of their defense. I gotta be honest, I'd probably love to try a case in front of this guy. It seems like his deference to the defendant is just wild. Um, I, I get it. I, I love people's rights too. I'm a big fan of justice, but I think that, I mean, he's going even further than I, I would think a judge would go. As a practical matter, this trial judge, maybe wrongly, believes that we can't unring the bell. I think the jury's already heard the evidence. Uh, I think even though they say that they put it aside, we, we would presume that to be true. And he's saying, if I do this now, what's really the point? They've already heard it. So I'm creating an appellate issue and I'm not really going to create a solution because to strike him now would be kind of just illogical. And I, I don't disagree with him there. I, I think at this point, I definitely wouldn't strike his testimony. Like I said before, I would have carved out only what you can testify to, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty is what you can testify to a trial. And maybe we could have handled this beforehand, but it seemed like all this was done last minute, which is never the way you want to do it in trial. However, although very imperfectly stated, he did at the very end give a, an opinion in line with McNaughton. He, of course, going to overrule the motion to exclude. Um, Overruled, motion to exclude, He's all of his testimony staying in. Then we get to Cross, okay? And he makes some really great points. It's that male prosecutor that does the cross. He makes some really, I thought this was his best part of the trial. Um, he talks about, oh, this expert witness was hired on August 24th. He meets with Carly a couple days later and he has his opinion with all his diagnosis and Carly just wouldn't do that. She's not callous like that. All of that by September 3rd, which is also wild that that's the first time they saw the report and now it's September 18th and they're doing this entire bit of testimony, which is not... Not great if you want to prepare, but happens all the time, unfortunately. We're deposing experts a week or two before trial all the time. I hate it, but basically our, our remedy is, well, we can just continue it again, Mr. Tragos, if you'd like that. That's what the judge says to me. And I'm like, obviously, judge, I don't want to. So let's see if we can get this done. And they did it here. He asks for the legal standard. The expert says, you know, he thought he found the statute, but he knew it was wrong. It's not a statute. It's a standard. Um, uh, Carly's lawyer was there during the evaluation. Um he told Carly that he was there, the expert on behalf of her lawyers. So she obviously knew what this was about. And then he goes through and talks about how she didn't say this to somebody else. She didn't so say that to somebody else. She just says it for you. She just brings up this memory loss or the blackouts or all this stuff very conveniently to you for the very first time. And of course you say she's uncomfortable at other mental health counselors. She even said, and this is bad for her as far as you know, not guilty by reason of insanity, which you could end up being committed afterwards. She's like, she doesn't go to the mental health people anymore because she doesn't find them very helpful. Uh, he ad admits that he doesn't know what she knew at the time. He admits that she only says the blackouts were basically for the time period when she pulled the triggers, the trigger multiple times. Um, she remembers being at school. She remembers letting the dogs out. And then she just remembers waking up in a ditch. How convenient is that? The prosecutor says, and I think that's a pretty good point. Um, she never reported memory loss or hallucinations um, before, you know, all of this. Uh, main source of anxiety was mom finding out about her secrets. He got him to kind of admit to that. Um, he doesn't even know for sure if Carly ever took these meds that he's blaming all this on. Again, a good point. Uh, and I do just want to play about five minutes of it. This video is getting kind of long um, because, again, I bit off a little more than I can chew. But I wanted to give you guys as much as I possibly could from this trial to get us caught up three days in one video. Uh, but let's let's just listen to five minutes of the cross examination here, which I thought he did a really really good job on. Or appreciate the difference between right and wrong, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and you said you watched the videos. They certainly could, right? They could potentially, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> now, I guess your opinion here, as we sit here today, is that on March nineteenth, whenever Carly shot her mom, that she did not, in your word, appreciate the difference between right and wrong, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and you said you watched the videos uh, from the house, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and that's the standard that you have to have for not guilty by reason of insanity. That's why they keep asking those, you know, magic type of words. Is it your opinion that she didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong whenever she hid the gun behind her back? It's my opinion that in general at that period of time, she didn't appreciate, fundamentally didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong. Although I will also acknowledge that she acted in ways like that, that would seem to indicate that she had some appreciation. Okay. So he, he I, again, I think this witness is trying to be honest. He's like, because what the prosecutor is going to do right now is he's going to take that standard of didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong. 
And he's going to be like, but all this stuff, all of these actions make me think that somebody understands that they're doing something wrong, like hiding the gun, getting outside the side of the camera, looking around the corner, calling or texting her friends, saying she's wait, lying in wait for her stepdad to show up, shooting at her stepdad, fleeing afterwards. He's going to go through all that and be like, that makes me think she understands right and wrong. And even the witness agrees that generally speaking, he doesn't think that she understands the difference between right and wrong, but some of her actions do indicate some appreciation, as he said. And let's listen to the prosecutor go through them. So I guess, again, I would just simply ask, did, is it your opinion that she did not appreciate the difference right and wrong when she hit, hit the gun behind her back? It is my opinion that she did not appreciate the difference between right and wrong at that, point, at that time or at any point in time in that, in that period. Okay. Um, and in that video, when she peeks around the kitchen wall after uh, going to retrieve the gun, it, I assume it's your opinion that she didn't, know, she didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong at that time too, correct? That is my opinion, yes. Okay. Whenever she removed the camera from the wall, and hid it in the fridge. It's your opinion that she didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong. Correct. When she called and texted multiple friends, but obviously knew that she couldn't tell them what was wrong over the phone, then I assume that you also don't believe she knew the difference between right and wrong at that time. Um, I don't know whether it, it was obvious that she felt she could not tell them what she had done. I don't know why she didn't tell them. Well, she certainly tell she certainly told them she couldn't tell them, didn't she? I think that's right. Right. And did you ever talk or see any uh, talk to or see any text messages from a gentleman named um, Thad Gilbert? I don't remember. I've seen something about him, but as I sit here, I don't remember. I don't think I've seen those text messages. Okay. So sitting here as, as an expert, Dave, you've been, uh, if you've been introduced as an expert, and is an expert. And another thing that he said earlier, the prosecutor is like, if you don't have all the information or if you have incorrect information, that could affect your opinion or render your opinion incorrect. He says, yes, of course, if I have incorrect information, like every expert's going to say, then my opinion could be incorrect too. Um, if she were to have testified one of her friends, uh, Fiji, um, and told him that she fucked up, Excuse my language, but that's his words. Um, if she told him that, then would it be your opinion that she didn't know the difference between right and wrong at that time? It would. All right. What if she uh, told TG that she that he volunteered to call 911? She said, no, you can't do that. I assume she still didn't know the difference between right and wrong, right? Yep. Yes. <clears throat> when uh, her friend BG that you talked to or that you talked about earlier, whenever BG told her not to harm herself or anyone else, and she said it's too late, I assume didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Correct. When she told her friend that she inv invited over BW, that she put three in her mom and then her stepdad would be home shortly and she had three more to take care of him. Still didn't know the difference right now. Correct. And when she ran from the house, after it was all done, she didn't know the difference right now. Correct. But I guess in your opinion, a lot of it goes back to the switch in medication, correct? I think that's only a piece of it. I, I think there's much more than that. I think I think the psychosis, I think the, the mood swings and mood disorder had been present before then. The psychosis was clearly getting worse by March 12th before the Lexapro was switched. The dissociation had been ongoing. So I think there was, I think there was a lot else even before the Lexapro was begun. And then I think the Lexapro was uh, made things worse. Right. But to be clear, you cannot tie her actions. I believe you stated in your report. You cannot tie her actions. This is the big part here. This is the big almost end of cross. He asks a few more questions, but this was like the the culmination of his cross here, which is that that last sentence after the comma that the judge was like, this is probably why I should throw out all of his testimony, but instead you can just use it during cross. This is the prosecutor using it during cross. Right. But to be clear, you cannot tie her actions. I believe you stated in your report, you cannot tie her actions on March 19th to the switch in medication, correct? I think the switch in medication had an impact. I think it clearly had an impact. I cannot say Lexapro made her do this. Right. In fact, you state... In Carly's case, in my opinion, the Lexapro that she began taking clearly worsened her pre-existing psychiatric disorders, leaving her in a highly precarious state, but there's inadequate information available to attribute a direct causality to that medication, correct? That's correct. So you cannot attribute, as you sit here, a direct causality between the Lexapro and what happened on March 19th, correct? Well, I think there's some causality there. I think it made her mood problem worse. I think it made the situation worse. I cannot say that Lexapro made her do it. Right, because you have inadequate information, as you stated in your report, right? Correct. And again, how much weight is the jury going to shave off because of that? I don't know. But you're starting to get the idea. And if you sit here as the jury, you see everything that happened. You hear all the facts. You hear how cold-blooded it seemed at the time, what the defense is trying to argue now. We obviously didn't watch the whole three days here, but everything lined up perfectly for the state as they're proving the facts. But then the why that the defense has presented first, the jury's going to have to determine, did she understand right from wrong? Did she understand the gravity of her... Um, actions? Did she understand that she was committing a crime? Did she have criminal intent? But this is the last witness. The, the defense got back up, redirect. Who controls the interview, even though the lawyer's there? I do, of course. Any conversations you've had with people or anything on cross-examination change your opinion? No. This was, I thought, a horrible point. If you find yourself in a drainage ditch, you'd probably know you did something wrong. It's like, what? That's really your, that's your big 
aha moment is that she blacked out till she was in the drainage ditch because they were trying to figure out. And on cross, he was like, well, she admitted to the cops that she did it. She said she shot him with this hand. Um, she knew when she was given the gunshot residue, she asked how her dad was doing, obviously knew she did something wrong and she hurt somebody And the defense is being like, no, no, she must've just thought she did something wrong because there were cops there. Like if I woke up in a drainage ditch, I wouldn't automatically assume I did something wrong. I don't know about you. Um, so I think there are, there are ways I could see the jury going either way. I feel like I'm a little more skeptical. They also brought up like, yeah, her dad's the only one that corroborates and he's still supporting her. And the guy's like, I don't know what you mean by support. So I don't know. I don't feel like the state has tried to say there's a weird relationship between her and her stepdad. Um, I think based on my Twitter comments that you guys think there's something weird going on there. I thought he testified in a way that felt genuine to me and that he was a good witness. Seems like a lot of you guys didn't. Usually you guys have your finger on the pulse of the jury. Um, so we'll see if that's what the jury felt as well. If they thought that there was something weird going on between them, I don't know. Um, and then the defense rests. So now that the defense has rested, they are done. And the state has the opportunity now to put on rebuttal experts and explain why they believe she did know the difference between right and wrong, why they believe she was not insane, why they believe she is cold blooded or psychopathic or callous, um, or did it out of a panic, but wanted to do it because of what happened that day, they're going to put on the why starting Thursday. I think they'll be done either Thursday or Friday. Uh, closing arguments will be either the end of the day, Thursday, beginning of the day, Friday, we could have a verdict by the weekend. We probably will. If you look, if you look at what the judge has told the jury. So you guys let me know by hitting the like button on this video and let me know in the comments and subscribe to our page. If you want me to maybe do one more video on this, either during the verdict or after the verdict live answering your questions, or if this was enough and you're good, or you guys aren't watching this case, hit the like button anyways, and watch the video, but then let me know um, that you don't care much more about this case, but I really appreciate as always you guys joining me, sending me this case. It was a lot of work. This is why I don't like to jump into trials late later on in them, like three days into them. And I've probably learned my lesson yet again, but because the Adelson trial went away and I was planning on watching that this week, this one popped up. So I watched it. Whew, it was a lot. It was a lot. Um, I can easily do one day while I work doing three days while I work is impossible. I had to do basically two days um, at night. So it was, it was a lot tougher than I was expecting. And I'm tired. It's late. So hit that like button for me. If you haven't already till next time, I am out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of the lawyer. You know, if you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out the lawyer, you know, podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know.